Uh, with that, uh, then we will have Ms. Susie Dagan, and that's the only one I know Ms. Susie Dagan, even though she is married. Okay. And uh, to talk about Jane Adams and her early years, uh, basically up until the age of 18, 19. Until she, until, until she started in the Hollows. Okay. So with that, Susie, and read her Bible. Okay. <laughs>
and millers have a flat thumb that's very calloused. Um, they grade the grain by touching it, and it's uh, flour, middling, and grist. The flour being very, very fine, the grist being very, very coarse, and then the middling being <coughs> in the middle. So a miller is constantly dipping his fingers into the grain and feeling the grain like this. And because of it, a miller gets a very flat thumb and a very hard callous thumb. Um, you wouldn't think that would be a great thing, but Jane thought it was really cool. And so she talks about, as a child, grinding her thumb against the miller's wheel so that she can try to get a flat, hard, callous thumb, just like her father, and she admired him so much. Uh, her father served in the state legislature. He changed the inheritance laws of Illinois so that women could inherit. Up until that time, women couldn't inherit property or money, and he changed that law. Now, in his own family, his wife, Mrs. Adams, was very intelligent. All of his daughters were very intelligent, very well educated. His son was not. He had one son, Weaver, um, and he was mentally ill, probably had schizophrenia. So here was this great man who had all these wonderful female relations and a schizophrenic son, and that probably had a lot to do with his decision to change the laws so that women could inherit property and money. Uh, some of the early memories of Jane Adams, she mentioned in 1865, she saw her father cry. Um, uh, President Lincoln died in 1865, and her father cried. It was the first time she'd seen her father cry. Um, she heard about Lincoln. Obviously, she'd never met him. But she knew that Lincoln didn't live in Cedarville. She heard about him. She heard her, her father mention him, but knew he didn't live, live in Cedarville. Up until that time, her entire life was Cedarville. She wasn't concerned with anyone outside of Cedarville. And now this man, who didn't even live in Cedarville, uh, had died and her father was crying. So she mentions that it opened her eyes to the fact that there were people outside of Cedarville. There was a whole world outside of Cedarville and, and other people. Uh, she also mentions growing up in the cult of Lincoln. Uh, she was five years old when Lincoln died. And then throughout her life, well, her, her childhood, she talks about the effect of growing up in Lincoln's shadow, that the schools were filled with with Lincoln, and everything you did, eat your vegetables like Lincoln, drink your milk like Lincoln, learn to read like Lincoln, that they were they were taught in this shadow of Lincoln that uh, everything they did. <coughs> she talks about um, when she was eight years old, she was given a new cloak. It was a white cloak, and she had decided to wear it to church. And so she comes bouncing down the stairs with her new white cloak on, looked fabulous, and she told her father, I'm going to wear my new cloak to church. And he said, it's a very nice cloak, but you shouldn't wear it. And she said, well, why? It's a very nice cloak. He said that there were other little girls in Cedarville who didn't have a cloak as fine as hers. And it might make them feel bad to see her wearing this fabulous cloak when the other little girls weren't. And she, she was eight years old when this happened, and it, it affected her. It made her realize that not everyone was as privileged as her. Cedarville, being such a small town, there wasn't a huge class distinction. There, there were wealthier people and less wealthy people, but you didn't have a huge class distinction because the town was so small. And, and it was the first time she realized that not everyone was as privileged as her, not every little girl, had a fabulous cloak like she had. When she was eight years old, her father remarried and she got a stepmother, uh, Anna Halderman. She had been six years without a mother. Uh, her new mother was very fashionable, not socially minded like Jane and her mother were, but she was very into reading and education. Um, she loved to study and learn. So she got along with her mother, with her stepmother, quite well. But the best part of her new stepmother was her new stepbrother, George. Uh, she and George were the same age, and uh, they were inseparable. They were the very best of friends. They played outside together. She mentioned, uh, she mentions killing snakes with her brother, George. 
We have a letter at the Stevenson County Historical Society where uh, there, there's childhood maps where she's, it's like a treasure map or something, and there's an, a little stone where they kill snakes as part of their, their play. They must have had an incredible imagination. <laughs> um, she also talks about her dog, Buddy. He was a black shaggy dog, and she mentions in the letter that um, they used to, the river would freeze, and they were not allowed to play on the river. But what she and George would do is push Buddy onto the ice. And if Buddy was okay, they could play on the river, and their parents would never know. If Buddy started to sink, they got Buddy out of the river, and they stayed away from the river until it had frozen a little bit better. <laughs> I don't know what kind of dog it was, but it was um, a black shaggy dog, she mentioned. And then she also talks about the logs of the sawmill. Her father also had a sawmill, and uh, she, and this sounds like a wonderful melodrama movie, but she talks about she and George laying on the saws, and uh, laying on the log as it gets closer and closer to the saw, and then jumping off just in time. <laughs> I don't know if her parents knew that or not, but <laughs> probably not, I would hope. Uh, George was very interested in science and nature and biology. And because of this interest, um, Jane became interested in the same thing and later in life uh, considered becoming a doctor because of this interest in science and biology that George had, that they shared together. For 10 years, uh, for almost 10 years, they were constantly together, George and, and Jane, the very best of friends. At age 17, George went to Beloit for college, and Jane went to Rockford Seminary. It was an all-girls school. It was a school that her father had supported. Um, I, I know her older sisters went there. It doesn't sound like Jane really had a choice. It sounded like all the Adams girls go to this school. Um, she she mentioned that she was kind of annoyed at some of the things. They were taught, uh, they, there were some finishing skills. She was taught to make small talk, and she was taught to pour tea and such. Um, the goal of the graduates was to become a teacher or to marry a missionary. She, while, while she's learning this at Rockford Semin Seminary, um, she's writing back and forth to George, and George is having discussions on politics and history and theology, and she's just craving to have this intellectual education like George had. So, um, not being one to sit still, she, uh, she approached the school, and she, uh, through a long process, made them change it from a seminary to a college. Um, at a seminary, you don't get a degree, you get a certificate, and at a college, you get a, uh, you get a diploma. And so she fought to have a change. While she was in school, they changed it from Rockford Seminary to Rockford College, and then uh, she received the very first degree. Um, it was even labeled number one. She received the very first degree at Rockford College. Um, she decided that life should have a purpose, but she didn't know what it was at this time. I, I get the idea that she did some, some floundering. Uh, sometime at this time, and we don't know exactly when, but either while she was in college or shortly after it, George asked her to marry her. Her stepmother was very pleased. Now, step-sibling marriages were very common. Um, today, it seems weird. <laughs> I have a stepbrother, I wouldn't marry him, but <laughs> he's a very nice boy, but I wouldn't marry him. Um, but in the 19th century, step-sibling marriages were very common. In fact, Jane's sister married George's brother, so there, there was one step-sibling step -sibling marriage in the family. Um, if you marry your step-sibling, first of all, it keeps all the money in the family. Um, second of all, it assures the surviving parent of being cared for in his or her later years. Um, once, if you're in a step family, once your step parent dies, your legal obligation to him or her ends. Um, whereas if George and Jane marry, then whichever parent died first, uh, both kids would be obligated to care for the other parent. They would be, uh, well, in Jane's case, her stepmother. Um, would be her mother-in-law and her the grandmother of her children. So there would be an obligation for her to care for her 
even after her father died. There is a moral obligation anyway, but not a legal one. You, you don't have to care for your step-parent after your own parent dies. And these are the days before Social Security or welfare or any, any safety net like that. So this is something that people were really concerned about. So step-siblings were very, step-sibling marriages were common. Um, George resented her social ideals. He, he wanted a wife that would be seen and not heard, which was the perfect Victorian wife. She didn't want to do that. Um, George later had a mental breakdown, and I kind of wonder if Jane saw some of those signs early on, and if that was one of the reasons why she refused to marry him. Um, we don't know, she never mentions it, but it's living so close with George, um, she may have noticed some things that, that came out later. We don't know. Uh, Jane had back problems, and she had been told that she could probably not have children if she didn't be questionable, and the purpose for a Victorian woman to get married is to have children. And so she kind of had the idea of what's the point in getting married if you can't have children. That was the, the main reason for being married at that time. So she refused. And George was crushed. She was absolutely crushed. Um, the refusal, combined with the stress of his medical studies, gave him a mental breakdown. And um, he moved back home to Cedarville, lived with his mother, and was said to have never left the home again. Um, and he died at 48 years old. Her stepmother was extremely angry at Jane. She, she blamed George's bad health on, on Jane. And her relationship with her stepmother never really repaired after that. Uh, Jane threw herself into her schoolwork. Um, from then on, when she visited Cedarville, she would visit her mother, but she always stayed at her brother Weaver's house. She didn't actually stay in the Cedarville home because things were so uncomfortable with her stepmother. Uh, Weaver's house is the one that used to be a bed and breakfast for just a few short years. It was called Cedar Cliff, and, um, and it, it kind of overlooks Cedar Hill. So it's a beautiful house. She graduated from Rockford Seminary in 1881, was president, was valedictorian and president of her class, and things were really going well for her. Um, the summer after her graduation, her father died. It was a very quick, unexpected death, and she was completely blown away by it. Um, she left Cedarville for Women's Medical College in Philadelphia and decided to become a doctor, but she didn't stay very long. Um, she was having more trouble with her back. Uh, the pressures of the medical school were very difficult, and she seemed to be going through a depression because of her father's death. It was a very bad time for her. She ended up quitting school. And in the following year, her stepbrother, Harry Halderman, he was a doctor, he performed back surgery on her. And she, she was much better after that. Um, Jane and her stepmother went to Europe for two years. Now, um, it, for the tour. Victorian women at that time had the tour. And you went to Europe if you could afford it and um, visited museums and art and history. And it was a great place to meet a husband. And so I'm sure that was part of the underlying reason why she took the tour. Um, if, you're, if you're an American who meets an American in Europe, you know that that is someone from a family who can afford to travel. So you know that that's a wealthy American. So a, lot of, uh, the, a big part of the purpose of going on tour in Europe was to meet a husband. Um, <laughs> she didn't, of course. Um, she traveled and wrote and studied. She learned to manage her personal affairs. Now, when her father died, she inherited a lot of land and a lot of money and had never really managed her own money before. So while she was in Europe, by letters back and forth, um, she owned some farms and she wrote letters to the um, to the farm keeper so that she knew what was going on, so she helped him make decisions. She became very involved. She decided this was property she was going to own. She didn't want to be a silent landlord. She wanted to know what was going on. She started paying attention to her money. She was paying attention to her farm um, and really got involved with it. 
Um, and of course, this is all while she's in Europe, so she's doing it by letters back and forth. She went to all the very, very fashionable places, just like a good girl on tour, on the European tour should. And she really felt the class struggle and the differences between the very rich and the very poor. Um, they stayed for two years and then returned back home. And she, you still get the sense that she's kind of floundering, that she doesn't really know what to do with her life. Um, a woman at this stage should get married. And she decided that she didn't want to. She didn't want to marry George. She didn't want to marry anyone. She, had, she was financially secure. And so she didn't have to marry someone. Um, a lot of Victorian women, you had to get married in order, to, in order to secure your financial future. But she didn't have to. She had her own money. She went back to Europe, and this time she was with her friend, Ellen Gay Starr. And this was not the official European tour. This was a different tour. Uh, she and her friend visited Toynbee Hall, and that was a settlement house in London. Um, it was in the very poorest section of London, and Toynbee Hall was a gathering place for the sons of wealthy men in London. And the point was that these young men were going to be the future leaders, and you can't lead the poor unless you understand them. These were privileged, young, spoiled men, and so they would spend time at Toynbee Hall with the poor, understanding them, understanding their wants and needs, and this would make them become better leaders later in their life. This was a whole new concept. Rich people weren't supposed to touch the poor. They weren't supposed to talk to them. They weren't supposed to try to understand them. This was a, a brand new idea. Um, and uh, Jane was very intrigued by that. In 1888, she was back in Cedarville, and uh, she and Ellen Gates Starr decided to develop their own Toynbee Hall here in America. It would be the very first. Um, they found the Hull House Mansion on, Hull, on Halstead Street in Chicago. Now, Charles Hull had lived in the mansion and had a huge farm around it. Um, really, you get the idea that it was kind of a plantation type, type thing. Um, and the city of Chicago was nothing when the mansion was built. And then the city grew and grew and grew and kind of squeezed into his farm. And he sold off pieces and pieces and pieces. So eventually there was just one very nice mansion in the middle of slums. I mean, the city had grown around him. Um, at, the time she, at the time she was there, she rented the house later purchased it, but at the time she rented it, it was owned by Charles Hull's sister. And really, I think she was glad to get rid of it, because how do you sell, you know, a big part of real estate is location, and here you have this very fine house in a horrible neighborhood. So I get the feeling that the sister was glad to get rid of it. Um, they decided to name it, and they came up with a whole bunch of different names, but the neighbors continued to call it Hull House, because this was Charles Hull's house. So they just gave up on their names and decided to call it Hull House, just like everyone else. She always writes it with a hyphen, Hull hyphen house. Um, I don't know why. They decorated it, they invited the neighbors in, and they provided food and clothing, but they also fed their souls. Um, she, uh, based on the Toynbee Hall philosophy, they wanted to get to know these people. They didn't want to just throw them a sandwich and leave. They wanted to get to know them, understand them, help them in ways that they could, um, which was unheard of. This was a crazy idea, and, um, and they were very successful at it. Um, for almost 50 years, she was at Hull House, and that was her home. And uh, she, she writes that her life finally had a purpose, that once she was floundering, and once she started Hull House, her life finally had a purpose. That was quicker than I thought. I will take questions, or do you want to break for snacks first? Jim, I'm looking at you. You're right. I know you're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> we can ask questions. Okay. Have questions okay. Okay. Any questions? Yes. I would like to know where your Glen Creek Farm was that you worked at. Oh, um, it was in, uh, was it Wheaton? It was in the Chicago suburbs, and it was um, like Home House. It was a farm that was intruded on by the city. And um, it's um, an 1890s living history farm. 
and it was owned by the Park District. It still is. It's, it's still it's an actual operating farm, but all scaled down. Um, I think they said the farm should be about 40 acres at that time, and it was 18 acres. And our kitchen garden should have been a quarter acre, and it was like an eight. Everything we did was smaller, but it was uh, it was on the same. It was living 1890s life. It was cool. Yes? Yeah. You know, we always hear about how uh, when John Adams died, his property was all split, split up, some yes. money and so forth, the property, and all the kids got part of the property. Has anyone ever actually written down what each one of these kids got in the way of property? I do. I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with some of them. Yeah. I'm familiar with some of them. Um, it must be written down somewhere, just in legal papers. I know that, um, that none of it is left. Uh, um, Jane spent all of hers on Hull House. Uh, that, that was her life mission. She, she spent all of her money on Hull House. Um, her brother Weaver was in a mental institution in and out his whole life, and that's where the bulk of, of their money went. In fact, while he was institutionalized, his wife, Laura, would come to Hull House with Jane. His, Weaver's wife and Jane were very good friends. Um, one of the sisters was a preacher. And so, or, or no, one of the sisters married a preacher, and so I'm sure that that money went to charitable places. Um, it was a poor preacher. Yes. She had to support the family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but I mean, I'm familiar with some of the property that's here. Um, we're, I'm sure you're all familiar with Grandview Cemetery. Uh, much of the property around the Grandview Cemetery did belong to Jane Adams. Uh, in fact, one of the last pieces, one of the last pieces that was sold, uh, you know where Winter Sheep Road is, okay? When you go down 26 to Winter Sheep Road, and you turn left at that point, and on the right hand side, not the first parcel of land, but the second parcel of land for 60 acres there. That 60 acre piece still exists. I was owned by another farmer, but that was her land there. As I say, much of the land around Grandview Cemetery also. Was her property. And now, didn't Grandview start as their private cemetery? I thought that the first grave there was an infant daughter that died, and then and so they buried her there. And then when they needed a cemetery, he kind of offered that space. I don't know. I don't know about that. And there is, by the way, there is still one piece that belongs to the Adams family. Okay, and that's the big piece of farmland across from the Cedarville Cemetery. Going all the way from Red Oak Road to uh, Cedarville Road, from the creek, uh, the farmland, and up the hill. It must be, what would you guess, about 300 acres, something like that. Oh, no. That that belongs to a uh, descendant of uh, uh, Marcet. Okay, a descendant of, uh, of the Hallman family. Yeah. And by the way, that descendant that owns the land is a member of the historical society. Oh, <laughs> Don't have visitors, she's in Leesburg, Florida. <laughs> now, I knew you had a program on Marset. She's a whole other character. I didn't see that program, but I've, I've done some reading about her, and she's a right. Yeah. <laughs> you have to ask Paul about Marset. He's reporting on Marset, okay? Yes. The lady who's the partner was her at all her from Durant. Do you know anything about that? Ellen Gates Um, She uh, partnered with Jane initially and then she got married. And oh, she, no, no, don't start with that. Is it the second partner? I don't know why. Well, because someone was, someone was married. Because someone was very involved with Jane and they got married and, and quit. You know, well, I'm sure she had friends that were married, but not that old time. Okay. There's a very interesting book on the Ellen Star on her paper day. So that um, <clears throat> the author came out to Mary a year or two ago. Oh, cool. And, and uh, okay. it, I, I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll look it up and let you know. It's yeah. very terrible. But Ellen, Ellen Star and um, Jane Adams was always, no matter how liberal her thinking was, she was always very diplomatic. She never rocked boats. But Ellen became 
quite radical and she didn't mind rocking the boat at all. She sometimes embarrassed Paul House with some of, with some of her outspoken ways. But uh, then uh, Ellen was a, an artist and she took up bookbinding, which is a wonderful yeah. art and skill in itself. Uh -huh. And then in, in her middle age, she became a Catholic and sort of a part of in that sense. Uh -huh. But uh, Ellen was, a, Ellen was a, an invalid in her later days. I've forgotten what happened, but, but uh, she had a niece out there. She went up there, ended up in a convent um, just north of New York. And uh, Jane Adams visited her regularly. And Jane Adams made sure that there was money for Ellen. And after Jane Adams died, the uh, head of the board at Hall House uh, wrote to Ellen and said, you know, Hull House is falling on hard times and we're not sure we can, you know, uh, keep this arrangement. And she reared up as she could do. And she said, how dare you yes. defy Jane Adams' wishes? And she saw to it that she got that, you know, it was a very small amount, but yeah. she, she, she knew how to fight. She, she was a feisty gal. Yeah. Some say prickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was, I, I have another segment on Jane where I talk about the after Hull House, and um, a lot of people didn't like her. And it's, it's almost more fun to research the people who didn't like her, she, um, Jane, the people who didn't like Jane, because she was so open-minded, because she let anyone speak at Full House, whether she liked them or not, and she had, um, you know, anarchists and socialists and all these horrible, horrible people. How can you let them speak in your home? And she would let anyone speak, and and her, and her philosophy was listen, just listen to them. You don't have to like them, just listen to them. She and, was against violence. Yes. Yeah. She, she was a pacifist, but she believed that everybody should speak, no matter what their speech is, you know, but sure. Yeah. She had, she with a group of other women had developed a plan to not have World War I. There was, you know, things were brewing, and I think it was called the Women's Peace Summit, Women's Peace Union, or Confederation. <coughs> they developed this plan to avoid the war. <laughs> and uh, they they even sent out delegates to go to different countries and tell them, explain this plan to the leaders, and people just laughed at them and they had to war anyway. But yeah, she was very much a pacifist, which was considered unpatriotic to, to not <laughs> like war. It's very patriotic to like war, and so she was not liked by a lot of people. Have you heard about the BAR? Uh, Jane Adams, they, they were descended from Revolution. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Holloman, her sister, joined the DAR at the same time she took out the membership for Dave and Jane. Uh -huh. So and after World War One and, and all of her pacifists, you know, the DAR cut her off. Uh -huh. and, you know, and she laughed about it. She said, I thought it was a membership for life, but apparently it was membership for good behavior. <laughs> 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 So I, I knew somebody who was connected with DAR, and I said, what does what their record say about her? And they said, the record said that she resigned. Uh, no uh, way. Uh, they resigned yeah. her. They but at the same time, they, they have a list of the DAR dazzling daughters. Uh -huh. <laughs> Imagine a dazzling daughter, and she's one of their dazzlers. Oh, yeah? <laughs>
Um, I, I grew up in Naperville, but I always tell people I grew up in Naperville before it was Naperville. When, you know, now Naperville is full of money. When I grew up, there were still farm kids in my high school. Um, I volunteered at Pine Creek Farm, or I, I used to. Now I volunteer at the Apple River Fort, and uh, it's 1832. It's a fort, it's a civilian fort. It wasn't planned. It was during the Black Hawk War, all of a sudden they panicked. They built a fort as fast as they could. They hid in it for a while, didn't even live there. They would sleep there and then go back to their farms during the day. And then there was one very short battle and then the, um, the fort was taken apart and, and, and life went on. Um, so I volunteer out there and we butchered life in 1832. And in the fall we butcher a hawk. And it had always been done by the men. And so one year I said, I, I want to do it, I want to help. And <laughs> they were a little skeptical but they let me help. And, um, and we continue to do it every year in, in the late fall, early winter. And uh, I, I distinctly remember one year, this would have been my first year, and there were three of us butchering it. Me, uh, guy John, and then Chris. And the first step you do is um, dip the hog in boiling water and then pull out the bristles. And it's, it's hard work and it's, it's very fast, and of course it's cold and it's wet. And, um, and I'm pulling out these bristles, and I'm doing fine, and John is doing fine, and it's just killing Chris. He's cramping up like you wouldn't believe. And um, I said, I think I'm using my knitting muscles, that I had no problem pulling out these bristles. And um, of course, Chris didn't have knitting muscles. And John worked in an historic farm, uh, a historic farm museum, and he was the dairy expert, and he milked cows according to their time period. So his 1850s cow, he milked by hand, and then the 1820s cow, he used equipment, and then I think there was an 1890s cow too. So he was used to milking by hand, and he said, I think I'm using my hand milking muscles. And John and I did fine point out the bristles, but it, it nearly killed Chris. He was cramping up. And do you use a scraper to get the hair off? No, we pulled the bristles out, and then the very, and then we use a knife, a very dull knife, and scrape it, which kind of gets off. It, we found it doesn't get off the bristles very well. It gets off a layer of skin, so you get a pink, white, pretty hog, you know. But well, it, I remember you know, when I was a kid, pull out. scraper. Yeah. Like a bowl upside down with a handle. Oh yes, uh huh. And you scrape that, and then put them in the hot water with blue right. wine. Okay, we didn't we just use straight water. Uh -huh. Yeah. We just use water and our barrel is, you know, a basic barrel. So we do them in head first and you can only clean half the hot. And then you have to spin them around and then do the other half and then clean the hot water? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And what we do is, you know, it's a hurry up and wait thing. We're boiling the water, we've got every bucket we own on the fire. And you're waiting and waiting, and then someone says, okay, yeah. And so we grab the buckets and throw it in the barrel because it's cold. And so we you, we have to do this hog before the boiling water cools. We throw all the buckets in the barrel, and then we do the hog. And so I was uh, walking around, and of course I'm wearing 1832's clothes, and my skirt just felt funny, and it was it was frozen. And it was like wearing a skirt made out of sheet metal. It wouldn't bend. It was just, you know, this heavy, frozen, I could kick it, you know. It was very strange. So. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm going to my mother was happy in the Rockford College for three years back in the late 1920s, early 1930s. But that was too late to see Jane Adams. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The college is still around. Um, I think they've changed it to Rockford Career College. They changed the name again, but it's and and they realize how important she is. They um they, they've got some stuff they dedicate to her there. Yes. It's interesting on the on Rockford Female Seminary. Uh, we've got a whole series of letters that uh, were written about the Clayman family. Back oh. here, where they refer to it uh, in some cases not as Rockford Female Center, but rather as Forest City. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. right? Because there were so many trees. Yes, Rockford. Right. Now, this may not have been the name of it, right. but the girls on the top of their letter were right, Forest City. Yeah. Um, right. away. Uh -huh. um, well, Rockford was called Forest City, so that's. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. My grandfather was born in 1859. I remember him saying that he knew Oh, wow. Saying what? 
He knew Jenny Lambert. Really? Yeah. 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 And he was one year younger, but older. He was just a year older. Yeah. Well, you all know Clyde Kaiser, of course. And um, I got as much information on that man as I possibly could. But he talked about attending Jane's funeral. And uh, he, they took the kids out of school because they knew it would be important enough that it was worth missing school. And um, he said, uh, what was it? There was some school kids had flags, there was a line of flags. And someone told me that the, the boys, the young boys, would stand at the edge of town. There were so many people coming in from Chicago, but they would stand at the edge of town, and all the Chicagoans would come in and pick up a boy. And then he would be your tour guide, and he would point out where Jane Allen's house was and where all these different things were, and then you'd give him a tip and let him out, and no one would do that to him. they were boy scouts. Were they boy scouts? Yeah. What, what year? What year? 35. 35. 35. What, what time of year? They, they, Paul, uh, Paul was one of the Paul bears. That's right. I was there. Were you? With your grandfather. Yeah. <laughs> With your grandfather. <laughs> With your grandfather. <laughs> I'm sorry? 1935. 1935, yes, uh huh. Yeah. And my mother, they, uh, my, uh, Jane Ann's visit to my mother. Oh, okay. And uh, they were close, but, and I don't know what the, what the reasons were. Right, huh? It was a social okay. call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were both pacifists. Your yeah. mother, Aunt Ann? My grandpa Dixon and Jane Ann, they were close, and uh, my grandpa Dixon had a uh, Radio show on WGN that was called uh, New Time Chimes. Mid -day, mid -day service. Mid -day. And, uh, yeah, they had a couple of these depending upon the uh, radio station. A lot of people don't know it, but uh, Bonnie's grandfather, who was a Methodist minister here in the 1920s, mm -hmm. he was married to Wally's mother. Oh, okay. Right. A second marriage for Wally. Okay, yeah. But uh, he was an avid pastor. Who was the Pacifist. Yeah, he was quite uh, centered. Yeah. Yeah. Who yeah. 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 subscribed to Harper's in the last month? It was kind of unusual for a Christian. And it was um, a very small group. Friendly, friendly, friendly logical studies were um, you feel your head, and based on the bumps on your head, you can tell if you're if your intelligent section is bigger or your stupid section is bigger. And it's a lot like reading palms. And um, some people take it very, very seriously, but most people kind of laugh at it. And you you got the idea from these notes that they were they were struggling to show people how serious it was. And this was a very serious scientific thing. And they kind of, and the, their meetings didn't last very long. The, the society petered out very quickly. But you, you got the idea from her from the notes of how, um, how they struggled to teach this important, true science to people that just laughed at And it was her and her mother and George. They were all participants and some other people as well. And just a few meetings and petered out. But, you know, she, she loved to learn stuff, and, um, and and that was unusual, especially for a woman in, in her time, to be so, so want to learn. <coughs> More questions? Uh, one other comment on, on, on Jane Allen's it's, it's often, I find it's often fascinating to pick up on the very little things that happened in someone's life. For example, we talked about who the first teacher was of Jane Adams. Uh, we talked about how she got her name from a certain teacher and so forth. Well, you know, whatever happened to these people? Right. Well, her first teacher, of course, was uh, Julia Eastman, and she became Julia Eastman uh, Bright, uh, Brace. Uh, her, Julia Eastman's parents are buried in the Cedarville Cemetery in the old section. You can see it down here in the front. Uh, she, late, uh, later on, Julia 
East Embrace, uh, they moved, uh, her family, her husband, they moved to Iowa. And uh, we had an article in the newsletter about two years ago about whatever happened to her. Believe it or not, we had someone who went onto the website that we had, read that particular article in the newsletter, uh -huh. wrote me an email, and it turns out that this woman who wrote me the email was a neighbor of Julie Eastman Brace's daughter, who never married, uh -huh. and she had just died the week before this woman wrote me the, uh -huh. the email. And then you have the woman uh, who supposedly gave the name to the GFs. Well, her name was Thorma. Was Thorma. She ended up marrying a Civil War cavalryman by the name of Henry Forbes. Okay. Uh, they, after leaving the Cedarville area, a couple, uh, they moved to Central Illinois, and they both remained involved in education for many, many years. And ultimately, the couple uh, moved out to uh, Oregon, and they died uh, out, uh, out there. So these are the little things yeah. that you look at and say, well, gee, whatever happened to, whatever happened to. Yeah. Believe it or not, things do happen to these people. Mm -hmm. And it's sometimes interesting to find out where they finally end up. Yeah, I, I like the little snippets of, I read uh, Devil in the White City, which is a, uh, it's a wonderful book. It's um, it's creepy. It's it's two stories going on at the same time. It's the story of H. H. Holmes, who was a serial killer in Chicago during the time of the uh, World's Fair in 1893, and then at the same time is the story of the architect who was under such pressure to design the World's Fair. And it's a fascinating book. But they mentioned there that Jane Addams went to the World's Fair and had her purse stolen, and I thought, well, who? Who found that out, you know? Where, where is that little snippet of, and this is one that, this, the book, Devil in the White City, is fabulously researched, and there's a huge section of notes at the end, but, you know, who, who wrote that down? Did she write it in the letter, you know? Her purse was stolen, so, somewhere there's documentation that her purse was stolen at the World's Fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love little snippets like that. Yes. I'm amazed at all the details that you seem to know about her life. <laughs> I remember snippets. <laughs> a lot of it is stuff that I picked up from books and also from reading letters at the Historical Society and just, um, I, I like snippets. <laughs> you love history. I love history, yes, uh huh, yeah, yeah. And I, Harriet Gustafson at the Freeport Journal Standard, her, a famous quote of hers is that history is just gossip. It's, it really is all this. <laughs> all these little snippets. No, I don't. I live in Stockton. Um, I lived in, uh, I came to Freeport maybe 10, 15 years ago, and uh, then lived in Winslow for a while, and now I'm in Stockton. So, and I have a home there. So I'm, I've been there, I think I'm in 2003. So I've been there for a while. I played the piano for her and her husband's wedding and went up the church. Yes, uh huh. <laughs> Jim mentioned my new name. I still go by Susie Bagan and a lot of things, but my name is actually Susie Kraft. I married Granny Kraft a few years ago. And um, the reason why I still use Bagan, and, and Granny hates this, but um, I raise sheep and I sell wool, and I go to a lot of historical events and I dress historically and I sell my wool. And I, I always have to tell the event organizers, I'm not a crafter, I'm a farmer. Put me with the farmers, don't put me with the crafters. And so now I'm married and my name is Craft. Ah. So I, I have to explain, I'm, I, my name is Craft, but I'm not a crafter. I'm a farmer, my name's not a farmer, but I am a farmer named Craft. I'm not a crafter. So. <laughs> with a C, yeah. And, Around, he's from Wisconsin, and around here, Kraft is a German name, and everyone spells it with a K. So I always have to explain to people it's with a C, and then they still look in K. I, I don't see your file. With a C. I have about 40. I have 30 some, and um, um, they're getting sheared. 
this week, hopefully, I'm on, I, I myself am my constant companion because the shear has me on the list and it's, you know, these things aren't well planned. They'll just call up and say, I'll be there tomorrow. So then I can drop everything for the shear. Um, and I'm very excited because I have, I bought a black ram last year. So this year I have about 20, about 20 lambs and half of them are black and half of them are white. And I sell my yarn, they're historic breeds of sheep. And um, I sell my yarn to reenactors and museum volunteers and, and the sort of people that care that it's historic breeds. Most people don't care. And I don't dye it, so I sell my white yarn. But then the fun thing about having black lambs is I can have black and brown and gray yarn. How did the family outcast come to become the black sheep? Oh, um, ah. that, that's a good question. Um, the color is a recessive trait in sheep. And so you can have two white sheep that have a black lamb. And and nobody, I think it's very exciting to have, exciting to have black lambs because they're fun and their wool is, is fun. Um, but in the early days before chemical dyes, you didn't want a black lamb. You wanted a white, all white sheep because white wool really dyes well with natural dyes. Black wool does not die. It just has to be black because you can't over dye it. So you didn't want black sheep. But it is possible for two white sheep to produce a black lamb. So the, the black sheep of the family you didn't want because these little black lambs you didn't want. You wanted white lambs so you had good white wool. I get asked that a lot. And, and a black lamb, a black sheep, is any sheep that's not white. So he can be gray or brown or black or spotted. Any sheep that's not white is, is a black lamb. I think I spoke about sheep a few years ago here, so. Oh. So you got you got two you got two talks at the same time. Yeah. I'll talk on any subject. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. 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 Thank you.